Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we welcome you back to another important episode of The New World Next Week. NewWorldNextWeek.com gives you the links to the sources, the audio, the video, and so very much more. James, a rather dark episode this week, and we'll get right into it with a story via the UK Independent. Lord Justice Fulford campaigned to support pedophile group. One of Britain's most senior judges campaigned to provide legal support for a pedophile group which was trying to lower the age of consent to four. According to reports in the Mail on Sunday, Lord Justice Fulford was praised by the Pedophile Information Exchange, PI, for coming to its defense when he co-founded a campaign which defended its members from criminal charges. The newspaper said Lord Justice Fulford was involved with the National Council for Civil Liberties, NCCL, a group which has been criticized for its links with PI during the 70s and 80s. When all of this blew up recently, James Fulford told the BBC that he had briefly been involved with the NCCL and the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, but that he had no memory of being involved in the campaign to support Pi and said child abuse was wholly wrong. So when I started to look into Fulford a little bit, I found two interesting stories, James. One from The Guardian, which goes back to March of 2013. Judges providing over, presiding over, rather, phone hacking cases elevated to higher office. So one, Lord Justice Fulford was one of the folks involved in the massive, ongoing, still not completely taken care of, UK media phone hacking case, which we can't rehash here. The other story, and this is a recent one, and James, within this last year, after residing on one of those cases, they moved him off the phone hacking case. He got a sweet gig as being an advisor to the Queen, and in looking up his name, I also found this comes from February 28th from Bedfordshire News out of the UK. Man convicting of convicted of having child sex abuse images on his computer wins an appeal, allowing him to access kids. And who granted him that appeal? That's right, Lord Justice Fulford. James? Well, I'm glad you brought in that context to this story, because I think the context is important here, and it is important to keep in mind that this story is sourcing from the Daily Mail, which I think any of the UK viewers will know is not exactly a reputable source of news. So we do have to, to um, take this with a grain of salt in the way they're framing it. And obviously, I think the listeners and viewers out there, at least regular viewers of this podcast, will know that uh, the people at the very top of the uh, the, the pyramid are disgusting, um, horrific people, who psychopaths, who would not hesitate to be involved in these disgusting child sex rings and the other things that continually be exposed are continually being exposed and often enough in 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 Europe and in Britain specifically amongst the gentry and the lords and barons and all these people in their sick uh, castles and all of that so we know this goes on but the context of this story paints a, a potentially very different story. So I want to throw in a couple of relateds, um, again, coming from The Guardian, um, one, uh, both related to this specific one that's been covered, this story that's been uncovered in the Daily Mail. One is under the headline, Judge Apologizes for Involvement with NCCL Group Linked to PIE, talking about how he was part of this uh, uh, gay rights group, the National Council for Civil Liberties, which had this association with this pedophile information exchange group. And he's trying to say, well, I, I wasn't approving of that connection. I was a uh, I was more with the NCCL part of this. And then the other one is a uh, uh, an article, again, from The Guardian, Who is Judging the Judges, which goes more into um, some of the background of this, including um, a very interesting part of this, which is that uh, Fulford, according to this article, had also been concerned at the use by prosecutors of the judge-made catch-all offense of conspiracy to corrupt public morals. The director of public prosecutions had brought that charge against Tom O'Carroll and two other PIE members in 1981 after they sent a booklet to MPs advocating acceptance of adult love for children. O'Carroll was jailed for two years. This is an interesting part of the story because I think people out there will also understand how it is always in the name of protecting the children that some of the most draconian legislation can be backdoored in because no one's going to complain to see these disgusting pedophile advocates being thrown in jail. Obviously, that's a good thing. But but through that uh, that public fear, of course, they can conduit in all sorts of draconian laws, which will then be turned against other citizens uh, um, in ways that we 
that we should no learn to expect, but we're not uh, expecting. So again, with the internet legislation that comes along, it's always about stopping child pornography, and it always ends up turning against people who uh, who are downloading movies or what have you. So uh, again, we have to be careful of that angle in this story and uh, what's uh, what's really at stake with this. But just as uh, as a further reinforcement of what I was saying earlier about the pedophile rings at the top um, I saw another article again from the Daily Mail from a week or two ago that I thought was interesting. Bill Clinton identified in lawsuit against his former friend and pedophile Jeffrey Epstein who had regular orgies at his Caribbean compound that the former president visited multiple times and that is a pretty horrific story when you get into the details and the fact that this man was keeping underage sex slaves at his Caribbean island and flying Bill Clinton out on his private jet on multiple occasions. So, again, we know this stuff goes on. We know that these people are involved in this, but we also have to be careful about the uh, the, the types of laws that are brought in to, uh, to uh, combat this. Uh, one other related that I'll tie in, James, was sent to me via Twitter at Daz Alt Theory, and, and it stays on the tabloid note, but again, I, I find it fascinating, I think, because the British have this sort of tabloid nature, because we don't have it here in the States, <laughs> It, st- it does, because they're just into exposing anything that'll sell papers, they do actually expose sometimes worthwhile things. So it's interesting to note that I've heard for a long time about the Madeleine McCann kidnapping, missing child. It took seven years for the UK now to announce that a well-known and convicted British pedophile was living right next to the resort where Madeleine McCann was kidnapped. So that comes from the mirror. So, James, we've got the Daily Mail, and we've got the mirror. Let's now, for our second story, we've had the bizarre sex. Now let's have the drugs. And again, I'll take it from the UK Independent. And of course, submitted to us by our good friend on Twitter, at GJ Salisbury. Vatican-bound, cocaine-filled condoms seized by German Customs. German Customs intercepted 12 ounces of liquid cocaine with a street value of some 40,000 euros, which is about 55,000 U.S. dollars, and it was bound for the Holy See's city-state. What's more, the drugs were held inside 14 condoms, something that not even Pope Francis has as of yet felt he could endorse the use of. Officers at the Leipzig airport found the cocaine inside a shipment of cushions, Coming from South America, the package was simply addressed to the Vatican Postal Office, meaning it could have been collected by any of the state's 800 residents. Subsequently, German officers handed the package over to the Vatican police, who set up a sting operation in an attempt to capture the intended recipient, but no one claimed the drugs. German authorities think that shows the person was tipped off. A spokesman for the German finance ministry, which oversees the customs office, has verified this report. James? This is, uh, I mean, what do you make of this story? Especially the uh, the irony of it being shipped in condoms. I mean, this is, um, it's off the charts, isn't it? And I, I guess uh, when I, whenever I think of Vatican corruption, my mind always goes back to the banquet of chestnuts. And for people who don't know what that is, I'll throw that in as a little Easter egg in the, uh, in the links. So please click on the link to find out more about that if you don't know about that uh, little episode from history. But, uh, but it does really raise the question of the types of corruption that go on in the Vatican that we know about and has been uncovered time and time again through pa- uh, papacy after papacy and, uh, and absolutely seemingly with no exception in the modern era. So again, we can't exactly lay this at the feet of Pope Francis. I mean, who knows to what extent uh, who, who was involved in this or, or what it was. My initial thought on seeing the headline to this story is, oh, it must have been some sort of prankster or something, but I don't think pranksters send 40,000 euros of cocaine um, on, a, on just a, 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 as a joke. So this is obviously something that was uh, going on, coordinated obviously with someone inside who obviously was tipped off um, uh, as, so the sting didn't end up catching him. But again, it just raises the spectrum of the, the corruption that goes to the core of the the Vatican and that uh, haunted Benedict uh, before before uh, Francis as well. And in fact, it, it brings to my mind the, uh, the, the story of Benedict's 
retirement, that whole bizarre story that still I don't think has ever been fully explained. Mm -hmm. But um, it did bring up to my mind an interesting article from um, March of uh, 2010, I believe. A papal aide, Vatican singer fired over alleged gay prostitute ring that apparently was uh, operating there in the Vatican. So um, so again, it just uh, corruption after corruption after corruption, and it just doesn't seem to stop. And this is the, uh, the most holy, revered institution in the world, or so they want you to believe. And uh, unfortunately, the rot is right there at the top. James, I'll include a couple of other related two articles I put into one tweet. Drug cartels rely on big banks to launder profits. And at the border, the drugs go north and the cash goes south. Interestingly enough, both these articles, one comes from NPR, the other comes from OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting, and they both talk about how the Sinaloa cartel runs their money through banks such as HSBC, and the article goes through so many other things. You might have heard of the Sinaloa cartel in the news lately because they've busted one of its latest leaders, that's El Chapo Guzman. And the last related James I'll throw in is a flashback to June of 1999, when the head of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Grasso, met with the Colombian FARC rebels and said, you guys have got a lot of money. You should invest it in the New York Stock Exchange. James, any any comment about, about those before we move to our third and final segment this week? Um, not, a re- not really, just to say business as usual in the New World Order. So, we've had the sex, we've had the drugs, and now we have not the rock and roll, but the resources. Sanctions against Russia? Well, don't tell ExxonMobil. This from the always interesting allgov.com. Imposing sanctions against Russia for its takeover of Crimea would not sit well with ExxonMobil, the United States' largest oil corporation. Now, ExxonMobil may be based in the United States, but that doesn't mean it's an American company, not in the sense that its interests and those of the nation coincide. Sometimes they might have shared interests, but in the case of Russia's power play in the Ukraine, ExxonMobil has far too much invested in America's former Cold War nemesis to see the U.S. government, led by President Barack Obama, get in its way of making money. While the White House searches for ways to punish Putin for annexing Crimea, it's business as usual, just as you said, James, for ExxonMobil inside Russia. Two years ago, the American oil giant signed a lucrative deal with Rosneft, Russia's petrochemical behemoth, to jointly explore offshore oil and gas in the Kara Sea in the Arctic Ocean and the Black Sea, where the Crimean Peninsula is. As part of this agreement, Rosneft acquired a 30% stake in 20 ExxonMobil offshore oil and gas exploration blocks in the Gulf of Mexico. This arrangement has not been compromised by the Ukraine Ukraine crisis. And James, as long as we're talking about oil, I think it's interesting to note and sad and disgusting and infuriating. Oil spill shuts down a Houston ship channel right on the 25th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez spill. And even more recently... BP spills unknown amount of tar sands into Lake Michigan, and that story is still developing. James? Well, exactly right. That is a particularly sad irony there. But um, but on the note of Russia and the sanctions, I for anyone who's been reading the International Forecaster, I have been writing about this for weeks now. I think that these sanctions are all hot air. That's why we've only seen bark and definitely no bite um, so far with the sanctions. And I don't think we're likely to see any precisely because of this, because of the interlocking nature of the multinationals that bear no allegiance to the United States or any particular country and are operating in Russia, so they don't want their interests messed with, and they won't be, trust me, they will not be messed with by these sanctions one way or another. So um, so it's all smoke and mirrors being played out right now, and I think that this just feeds into the larger global agenda, which, as that article does point out, has nothing to do with multinational corporations being beholden to U.S. interests or any other national interests. They are only 
only beholden to their corporate owners. And of course, what is Exxon Mobile, Mobile other than one of the seven sisters of uh, Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller dynasty? So we know who's really puppeteering this from behind the scenes. And of course, this leads into the, again, the specter of the new Cold War. Meet the new Cold War, same as the old Cold War, which, as we know from people like Anthony Sutton, was provided completely by support, technological and otherwise, military, financial, from the West. And that's how it was built up. And that that is exactly what is happening now, as you're about to reveal in a related story. And as Anthony Sutton also talked about um, in his work, he even predicted back in the 1990s when he was writing, or 1980s, um, when he was writing in, for example, America's Secret Establishment, he predicted that China would become the uh, the world's one of the world's leading economies by the year 2000, he said. Well, well t- switch that with 2010 and we're, we're pretty much there. Um, b- based on the, the interlocking uh, deals and, and contracts that are made with multinational corporations from the West with China. And he was seeing it there um, taking place uh, in the buildup to the, the Chinese behemoth with some of the contracts that were being signed in the latter part of the 20th century, but they're continuing, and not only China, but Russia. So once again, the whole Cold War mentality that's being built up right now is all smoke and mirrors. And I think to to drive that home even more, a uh, great related from Blacklisted News and Judicial Watch, U.S. gives Russia free military equipment. The secret operation was exposed this past week by members of the U.S. Congress that discovered it going through the 2014 budget and the 2015 budget proposals. And again, all the smoke and mirrors in the show and the sanctions will not affect really any of this. James, I think... In a way, this episode, this is, I think, from the earliest planning of it, should show that all of the revered institutions from the churches to the banks to your so-called elected officials are completely effed. They're all completely lawless criminals, and they should be treated and regarded as such. So having said that, I'll just quickly mention a couple of our updates and a couple of stories submitted via Twitter, hashtag New World Next Week. Abu Ghaith, Osama's son-in-law, has been convicted in his terror trial. We covered that story in full for a few weeks ago for you here on New World Next Week. And a couple of stories submitted to us, which you can do on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week. Again, an update on the ongoing saga of the Flight 370 out of Malaysia gets into AWACS, hijacking, sabotage, and propaganda. And I'll also note I actually just did an interview with Niall Bowie, who is based in Malaysia, RT reporter, and we talked about, in addition to Ukraine and China and Japan, we talked about Malaysia and Flight 370. Another interesting one from at Mamik, software, or rather spyware app, turns the privacy tables on Google Glass wares, and finally, YouTube enlists trusted flaggers to police videos, and James, I think as we close this, we'll throw that out to the audience to say... Don't let that happen. Well, that's the point. And I was just listening to your um, interview with Niall Bowie today, so I will recommend that. It was a good conversation. And unfortunately, we had a rather somber conversation today about business as usual and the new world order and the corruption of every institution imaginable. So hopefully next week we can have a more upbeat conversation, hopefully with some positive news stories. On that note, please submit your positive news stories ideas. Once again, hashtag new world next week or email James or myself, and we'll be happy to include that next week. So on that note, uh, James, thank you again for your time. Thanks so much.